Hi, I'm Dr. Paula Redmond, a clinical psychologist, and you're listening to the When Work Hurts podcast. On this show, I want to explore the stories behind the statistics of the mental health crisis facing healthcare professionals today, and to provide hope for a way out through compassion, connection, and creativity. Join me as I talk to inspiring clinicians and thought leaders in healthcare about their unique insights and learn how we can support ourselves and each other when work hurts. For many of us, the last couple of years have prompted us to think about how closely our lives are aligned with our values. And for some of us, the disruption to our normal way of life has created opportunities for pausing and reflecting on this. But for those working in healthcare, there's often a very painful confrontation between our personal values and the ways in which we're required to do our jobs. And this conflict can cause a huge amount of distress. In this episode, I explore this and other issues with Dr. Joe Oliver. He's a consultant, clinical psychologist and associate professor at UCL and an expert in acceptance and commitment therapy. And just so you're aware, towards the end of the interview, we do a brief exercise that involves some mindfulness work. So just make sure you're in an appropriate space if you'd like to join in. So we began by discussing what acceptance and commitment therapy is. Let me see if I can describe it in a nutshell and then we can sort of unpack it as we go. So obviously a type of therapy uh, that's originated in the last 20 or 30 years or so, maybe close to 40 now, I should probably update that, uh, and has its origins in proper old school hardcore behaviorism, which when I did my undergrad psychology was all about pigeons and rats and boxes and Skinner things and stuff I didn't really understand and maybe didn't find massively appealing. Uh, But nonetheless, uh, the, the psychology community has come full circle and become again really interested in behaviorism. And Curiously, of course, behaviorism, as perhaps uncool as it has been, has always been there for for a a long, long time. It's never went away. Uh, You know, we think about, uh, I don't know, uh, training children, for example, on how to use the potty or star charts or Facebook, for example, and and perhaps the evils thereof of Mark Zuckerberg and his little red kind of uh, uh, icons and things. Uh, nudge politics and you know examples of that in UK politics all, all of these things are really good examples of, of behaviorism alive and thriving so here's a model uh, that ostensibly on the face of it you it sort of sounds acceptance oh that sounds kind of like cool and you know nice and commitment and that sounds interesting maybe even a little woo woo and underpinning it is this deep hardcore underpinnings of behaviorism so uh, I guess that's sort of the theoretical background, and you know, to to I guess psychology's credit, I think as a as a discipline and as a science, it's ever evolving and moving and changing, uh, and I, I find that personally hugely appealing. And and here's one of these evolutions that, that that have happened in the in the science, and so there's models, behaviorism, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, uh, ACT, as it's known as. And also, it's talked about as, as a third wave of behavior therapy. So there's talks, as you can hear this, the metaphor there of the wave talks as evolution. At its at its heart, it's uh, it shines a light on these these two really important bits, which the the acceptance bit and the uh, and the commitment bit. The commitment bit being like, uh, in it principally about committing to things and uh, setting a, our course and direction in our life, knowing what's important to us, knowing what matters and where our purpose is and, and moving in that direction. And having the, the technologies, the tools, the approach, the stance towards ourselves and where we find ourselves that we have a, uh, we, we move with acceptance, which is to say, someone once described to me acceptance being a little bit like a, a reed that bends uh, flexibly and with agility in the in the wind, as opposed to say a, a, a steel rod that holds itself with rigidity. So depending on the context, it bends and moves and displays these qualities of acceptance, uh, all in order to be, able to, to be able to move forward towards the things that we care about. So in a nutshell, then yeah, acceptance, being open to our experiences. Uh, 
with with a quality that allows us to be in the moment, uh, to be mindful of our of experiences, uh, to not be disengaged and on automatic pilot. Uh, so that as we move forward, we have this this accepting and mindful quality towards our internal experiences as we take steps towards you know, things that we deeply care about, the things that really truly in life uh, we probably like want written on our gravestone, you know, rather than, hey, here's Joe, he avoided anxiety all his life. Uh, here's, here's Joe, he, you know, he did the things he cared about and he uh, took took courageous steps and, you know, he was scared sometimes and he was anxious and doubted. Uh and he did what mattered. So uh, there we go. And it's interesting because I think when I'm working with people and, and act as my kind of preferred way of working, um, I don't think I could describe it as eloquently as you, but I think there's a bit of a, a kind of branding issue around the language in terms of acceptance and commitment that I always need to kind of talk about because I think particularly for the people I work with, health professionals, um, you know, there's something about the acceptance and accepting uh, the working conditions that they often face and the commitment that they have to a sense of duty that become though both of those things can be really problematic for people and actually part of what really hurts about their work. I totally agree. Yeah, branding issue. Like uh, it's <laughs> branding and marketing. They, 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 someone should go back in time to the originators and say, you know, th this is all good and well, but you know, think about <laughs> think about the marketing issues and advertising. And it, that, yeah, completely. Acceptance is a such a thorny word. It's evocative and provocative. And most people, I say, uh, when I'm working with clients and training, you know, people always say to me, I say, what does it mean to you? And they say, it means things, it sounds like you're asking me to resign myself. It sounds like you're asking me to put up with stuff. It sounds like you want me just to kind of sit and shut up and be quiet. Um, and all of those things are particularly important in the workplace. And people are, of course, quite sensitized to any interventions that look like that, uh, i.e., you know the you know stress management interventions had a, have had and still continue to have an enormous problem with with that aspect. Like you just want me to put up with this? Like you want me just to learn some techniques so I can be less stressed, so I continue to work harder? Um, you know, be more resilient. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like you, you just want me to work harder, right? You don't want me to pay me more. You just want me to be more resilient. And in, in, in quotes there, yeah. Um, and there's your commitment bit, right? It's sort of commitment to what corporate values, trust NHS values, you know, some sort of words that look like they got sort of, you know, painted on the wall 20 years ago, and I don't really know what they mean. Uh, so the, the good issues in the workplace to be talking about, like how do we grapple with these things? Because certainly we're not inviting people just to sit quietly and put up with stuff. It's certainly not what ACT is about or any good at workplace intervention. And I would say this is a thing that corporations – big organizations should and do now wrestle with like what does corporate identity mean what do, what does organizational values what are they about and how do we bring alignment between individuals who care about all sorts of things not just work uh, how do we bring that alignment with it with an organization that I think you know for example and and then NHS principally does want to make important key differences in in people's lives and how do, how do we kind of bring those two things together is tricky and I think what I say, so do correct me if I'm wrong, but what I talk about with clients is that um, the the theme of acceptance is more about um, accepting our inner experience and, and dropping the struggle with our own thoughts and feelings so that we can um, f have a bit more freedom in how we choose to respond to the things that come up for us and, and to our pain. Mm -hmm. Have I got that right? That's a, <laughs> a really nice way to put it, for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because, you know, th th there's the thing, right? Is is uh, uh, helping us be more workable uh, in the face of, of of internal experiences, which it, it, of course pull mightily on us to to pull us in d different directions and want us to uh, fight with them, wrestle with them, squash them, shut them down, and. Of course, nothing, and there's no way there's anything wrong with those approaches per se. It's just as you're saying there, you know, that an ACT approach might sort of just introduce into the conversation that idea of the degree to which this is working in the service of the client and 
uh, their where they want to move to, the direction. Uh, and truth be told, I think from my own personal experience that I know when I'm getting into a really stuck place, uh, when I'm really kind of like locked up or feeling really rigid, and invariably the places when I'm really struggling and fighting with my experience, that like there's an emotion I'm, I'm just finding really hard to make room for. Or there's a thought that pops up that's kind of has a real zing to it. I'm just like fighting it. And I just don't want it. And uh, and I, you know, I can get caught in those places of wrestling with it or struggling to, to not have it. And a lot of energy goes into that. And uh, and someone might kind of quite rightly ask the question, well, what's what does matter here? What is important? And would you be willing to make space for those experiences, even the big difficult ones, in the service of doing the things that really care you care about? Um, and, you know, it's not an easy question necessarily to, to answer, but I think most of the time when I've had that opportunity to have that asked of me, it's been a really profound experience and uh, a really meaningful one. And I've, I've always appreciated when that context has been layered over those experiences. And just thinking about um, your experience and reflections on the pandemic, um, from a kind of act perspective, I, I wonder what, what, you know, looking back over these last couple of years, what your your act expertise has, has kind of lent to your your thinking and, and reflecting on this time. Yeah, gosh, just for any listeners who weren't aware, there was this global pandemic you might have heard of. That's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow, yeah, geez, it's a... It's, it's a just let Paula, when you bring it up, it just feels this this huge thing that looms, right? It's like, how do we get our arms around this stuff and this thing? And um, and you know, like it'll be interesting to 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 listen to this, what we're talking about, and come back in six months, twelve months. And if there's one thing I've learned is this stuff changes so much, uh, and it, it'll be invariably different. I was just actually before we met reading something I wrote at the start of the pandemic, and you know, kind of like some things that I think. Uh, I shared with people that are that were just my own experiences, and there's obviously some things that really have changed, but some things that actually that haven't. And yeah, wow, some so it's, it's such a huge thing to go through, and I feel like you know that that the the shared experience of it, you know, it's a, it's a rare thing for uh, humanity to go through this, such an experience in such a shared way, and um, and for it to be so big and traumatic and uh, to to be there's so much change, uncertainty, pain, suffering wrapped up in the shared experience, and the nature of it, as we see, is is it continues, and the the, the uncertainty of it is going to be something that's we we will live with for, I would say, years and decades decades probably, and however it, however it sort of rolls on. Yeah, and when I think about act and what what act might shine a light on uh, there's, a, there's a few things i guess have stood out to me and both in my personal experience and you know have i've lived my my experience through these these past 18 months two years and talking to lots of people and uh talking to people i'm working with talking to people who are my colleagues and people i train and so on and so forth but that that uncertainty i, I feel like is, is such a big part of this coupled with the need for us to continue uh, to continue living life with a sense of uncertainty and not knowing uh, and for some of us not all but for some of us carrying some some incredibly heavy burdens uh, that have either an anticipation of things to come or things that have happened traumas and losses and deaths uh, and for people at work being faced with huge amounts of uh, of all of this, this uncertainty and pain. Uh, so that question, like, how do we wrap our arms around this whole experience? I, th I think, of course, we can't. Um, there's a part of this that is 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 at the moment not not beyond us, but here's a really really big experience. And re rewinding to where we started with, and your point about that word acceptance, it's that's a. Two things I think spring to mind about that. One of us, I'd say, it feels incredibly important, uh, but I th I think it needs to be done and brought up in such a respectful uh, and careful way, in a cautious way. And the reason for that being, of course, that we wouldn't want to move into like this space and say and have a word or a thing that was too much about. Well, just accept this. 
make room for this. And there's, that, to me personally, brings up a lot of... Uh, that, that possibility just does not at all sit right with me. I, don't, I remember in the first few weeks of uh, the pandemic, you know, you know, of course, everything was flying around the internet, memes and whatnot, and, and someone sent this really well, well-meaning well video around that got posted on a list server, a professional list server I'm a part of, and it was, it was, I, I don't know if it was or not, but I sort of remember panpipes in the background and <laughs> very, um, <laughs> um, it was kind of like, and and what can what can we now learn from coronavirus? What can we learn from this pandemic? And I and everyone who saw it was just like toe curling me cringe about that because this is not the place to to be. Yes, of course we learn and we grow, uh, but we, we, there's a lot of other things that need to come first, uh, which is you know the, that facilitating us together as as a, a large community moving through this, making understanding it, allowing for the. The range of feelings, the grief and anger and loss, uh, anxiety to be there. Uh, I think that's a, an important part of uh, of this process. That those are that acknowledgement. This is this is uh, this is going to be here. Um, whilst at the same time, the, an acceptance piece is helping us to just remember to to not get to be conscious of 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 how we are in these particular places. And if I speak for myself, when, when I f- find myself under pressure or when I find myself going through a global pandemic, um, I get uh, I get anxious, I get, uh, my mind gets very catastrophic, it gets very, can get very negative, uh, it can get very, uh, just wanting just to protect myself and uh, does a, my, my, actions get very kind of narrow or very uh protective so which you know i I can appreciate and can understand why why i might do those things but the the sort of consciousness i might sort of want to bring to those proceedings would be just to slow down and to check with myself and ask myself how workable those actions are uh and in the service of as i do that as i slow as i'm more mindful with my experiences having some space to ask myself uh, like what? What is important? What does matter? Uh, what What do I care about? Um, in a in a gentle and respectful way, not rushing things and needing to get to an answer. And uh, it turns out for me, I found things that are are important is uh my family, and uh, be able to spend time with with my wife, my two kids. Uh, um, be another thing that's been really important for me is is having fun. Um, and there's a lot of time throughout these last 18 months I didn't have a lot of fun and I, was, I felt myself experiencing boredom for the first time for a long time and spontaneity was gone. Um, creativity was sort of stripped out a bit. Um, and another thing I found was was really important was taking care of myself um, and, and all the kind of ways that, that are, like, I might do that. But one thing I found particularly hard and it turned out it was as important to myself was being easy and, and gentle with myself in a sort of a way that kind of experience experiencing how I might not do that and the consequences of that remind me just actually how important that is. And one of the things that I, in this it was a, like a little article I wrote with a colleague of mine and a good friend, and one of the things we said was good enough is, is okay. And I think we were both speaking to ourselves when we wrote that and just reminding ourselves, you know, just slow down. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Good enough. Just get through this time. Um, yeah, I, f- I find that really soothing <laughs> to remind myself of that. That takes me back to um, homeschooling <laughs> days and, and kind of just that sense of constantly needing to go back to that sense of, you know, we we just need to kind of... <laughs> survive this you know intact and and with our relationships intact and um you know the the three and the six times table will be there (laughs) on the other side um but if we don't slow down and we don't look after ourselves you know i'm you know there were some scary times for me during that that that's that huge pressure and the sense of of failing at everything um and I found, um, you know, particularly or very much personally, but but also in my in my work, a sense of just constantly having to kind of step back and remind ourselves of what we're carrying, and you know, just how um, how 
difficult and unprecedented and uncertain these these times are and I think we very quickly can lose sight of that um, and those reminders can just be really helpful to to sort of ground ourselves in in reality that you know just everyday things have got a different quality and um, are much harder than they have been before and that for such a long time and it is exhausting yeah it's funny isn't it that that human capacity to to adapt to Mm. unprecedented situations and like of course in a lot of respects that's really lauded and people say oh isn't that amazing we can do this and look how resilient we are and uh and i think that's sometimes that ability strips away our, our other ability to appreciate and remember global pandemic things have got thrown on their, you know, tipped upside down and things are completely different. And, you know, we, we just sort of adapt and carry on and because we sort of have to, and it's can be easy to forget those things. And therefore that reminder, Hey, good enough is okay. Uh, doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, just survive and come through this. Uh, this will change and, you know, things will, th- things will be different. Just get through this particular part. Uh, yes. Yeah, such a, such a crucial piece of wisdom to, to hold on to. I was looking at all the, you know, I think it's sort of interesting looking at all the stats and the data. And I remember, you know, sort of tracking people's mental health and it sort of seems like, well, it varies, right? That's one thing I took from it, you know, depending on who you are and what your circumstances were massively impacted on your, your well-being. Surprise, surprise. But, you know, one thing that came out was I sort of read that, you know, hit people hard at the start and then people's uh, mental health bounced back and everyone's like, wow, this is, aren't we resilient? I felt like I read so many articles saying that and, and uh, I, I don't, my experience is personally, and just watching people and talking to people, that that has changed. Uh, that now, you know, that as we both, as time has gone on, and we're in this kind of weird position now, of waiting to see what happens. That actually, that's that second period of bouncing back has changed a lot. The sort of other impact is slowly kind of having wearing away at people again, of course, right? And again, it's that reminder of, yeah, this is a, a big thing we're going through. And there's something, I think that feels very relevant for um, the the health professionals that I I work with in terms of um, just the sense of exhaustion and and kind of no space to recover from, um, you know, particularly the the really intense period last year. And then things did start to feel a bit easier in the summer. And then, you know, we had, um, you know, the, the winter again. But I think over this year, what's what's been really tricky is people managing um, the the backlog, and you know the kind of trying to look after and maintain the quality of care for everyone, aside from the COVID situation, and just this sense of total overwhelm. Um, at this huge task and feeling so depleted coming into that and it's really hard to see a way out for people so I think there's it just feels like a, a long hard slog and a lot of pain associated with that <laughs> yeah yeah I know what you're saying yeah I, I'm laughing because it's there's, there's so much truth to what you're saying and it's it's, it's a uh it, it's a it, there's a the grind to it isn't there um, you know, and, and I, I think that really reflects this, this situation, which is ongoing and evolving, of course. And that's, uh, it's who knows where, if you and I sit down and do this again in kind of 12 months, what are we, who knows, who knows, I'm giving up trying to predict this. It'll be different. That's for sure. Uh, but as things stand now, that backlog of, uh, that, that, uh, people are experiencing, I think I would say that's, it's two parts backlog of all the things out there, all the tasks that got left, and now everyone kind of coming forward and saying, I want help. Uh, I also think that the emotional backlog too, just stuff that we've just sort of thought, right, park, get on, soldier on, deal with homeschooling, dealing with working from home, setting up a home office, dealing with, I don't know, finding you know new hobbies to entertain myself during the lockdown. And then suddenly it's, well, okay, then the space now to deal with, all that other backlog of stuff, backlog of trauma and grief and 
uh, and you know, emotional anxiety and I think anger as well. Uh, well no anger is, is a huge part of that. And I is, is clearly, well, connected to a whole lot of things probably going on at the moment uh, that people feel very angry about. Uh, uh, so a lot, a lot of processing of that stuff. And there's something as well, I know, you know, one of the concepts that I find helpful in ACT, which um, I think, um, I don't know if it originates, but he certainly talks about it a lot, Russ Harris, in terms of um, the reality gap, you know, the, the gap between how we want our lives to be and who we want to be as people um, and what we see playing out in our everyday lives. And that certainly feels really relevant um, for healthcare staff in terms of the values that have brought them into this work and their commitment to delivering high quality, you know, person-centered, compassionate care for every single patient and not being able to deliver that um, because of, you know, policies and procedures um, because of the huge demand, because of shortages, you know, lack of resources and maybe their own capacity at times. Um, And that being a very, very painful experience to be sitting in that gap. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's an incredibly difficult place. And, uh, and I I think it's a a very reasonable expectation to come in to uh, uh, healthcare with uh, and uh, both reasonable and it, it's incredibly appreciable too. It's it's such a it's a sort of valued thing. Uh, and nonetheless, people of course find themselves working in organisations, uh, large organisations, and organisations while made up of people sometimes don't have the capacity to be organisationally compassionate, organisationally caring. Uh, organisations that are themselves stretched have limited resources, budgets. Uh, and uh, under huge amounts of pressure, staffing issues, turnover, uh, all the kind of things that strip out an organization's capacity to treat their staff in a caring, compassionate, kind way. Uh, and that gap, I, I think, is, is huge for people when they just are, are confronted with the reality of uh, wanting to deliver care within an organizational context that doesn't either isn't has the inability to, su- to support them in doing that or sometimes actively prevents them from doing that. Uh, and yes, that reality, reality gap can be incredibly painful and difficult. Uh, and, and here's a really nice place I think ACT comes in, uh, which is certainly that for all of us, when confronted with it, with that gap, our inevitable automatic pilot responses will be something like wishing, wanting for, for things to be as they, as they should be, uh, and then, of course, getting stuck in lots of uh, worry or rumination for wh- for when they're not. Uh, I think probably possibly one of the, the one of the really toxic things that gets in the way of that ability just to head on acknowledge the situation and s- see it for what it is, is when it starts to confront our own identity about who we are as as people, who we are as healthcare workers. Uh, and we, of course, when we find ourselves working in a non-caring organisation, it's very easy to start taking that on ourselves, as we're forced to do things perhaps that uh, sit outside our our own professional values or our own core values as people, because you know we, sometimes we're left with, with uh, dilemmas that are there's just there's there's no good way to operate. Uh, you know, it's you know causing difficulties for for people using services call for us and it's just there's no there's no easy way through that and then when it, when our identity gets uh that, that sense of who we are or who we perceive ourselves to be gets pushed up against there's in, huge amounts of pain that come with that so the you know a, a, an act approach in these instances certainly wouldn't be saying anything about acceptance it, it's it's a it's about a, a you could say perhaps a fierce willingness to to see the situation for what it is and see uh, observe our, our own internal processes and our own thoughts and, and and certainly our own emotions and without engaging in those futile uh, efforts to change those or not have them which is to say like I would say a lot of those experiences are, are very real and they're very desirable even for an individual caught in a, in a system that's unable to be caring and compassionate those are 
those are in fact the very signs for that individual that they do care that, that their, their values are alive and kicking uh so what remains then is 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 in that space when we're inviting people to slow down and notice and observe and be less entangled in painful thoughts and a, a automatic desire to get rid of or suppress we can slow down and ask those really pertinent questions which would be to say like in the face of all this if you could choose if that were possible what would you want to stand for uh, what kind of what kind of health professional do you want to be what kind of person do you want to be um and that doesn't certainly mean I, I don't think that at all pulls for a certain type of answer. Uh, I think that uh, that of course it doesn't. I think it's that'll that'll invite people to think, take action in all sorts of directions. Some might it might might be a healthy withdrawal. Some might be uh, a, uh, a act, really strong act of self care move. Some it might be uh, uh, fighting and uh, pushing forward against the system and um, complaining, pushing, trying to make the, the changes that need to be made. Uh, so the, the ACT approach is, well, the, the values question, therefore, is a very versatile one uh, that, that uh, invites us to, to, to go into all sorts of places. I think one of the other things that is not necessarily unique but, but very particular about health professionals and I include myself in in that group is that so often um, those values around work and our identity as professionals is so closely fused with our sense of self-worth and um, our self-esteem and I know that that is working with with self-worth and self-esteem is an area of particular interest for you um can you tell me a bit about that and and how what act can bring to to these topics i tell you why it's interesting um and having written a book on self-esteem it self-esteem is not actually what i'm interested in it's uh it's it, it's connected to that though it, it's funny because self-esteem you know i don't know i it's such a big topic right it's like so one of those things you sort of ask anyone what do you know about psychology it's self-esteem it's kind of self-esteem is good and but then i then what actually is self-esteem it's kind of a little bit murky and i'd always thought you know uh the trick is to raise self-esteem that's good low is bad high is good and you know all the research evidence turns out to be uh to not support that um Curiously, there's an amazing study that, that went through about something like, I don't know, 10 to 20,000 studies on self-esteem. And, and their conclusions were, uh, well, there's, there's many, many conclusions. One certainly was that raising self-esteem is not a good thing. Uh, in fact, ra raising self-esteem leads to all sorts of bad things like uh, violence, uh, higher rates of narcissism, social disconnection, uh, eroding, you know, uh, pro-social activities. Uh, it, you know, and when you th when I thought about it, I thought, well, I could actually, I could perhaps see that. Then, in fact, that's the, 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 what they've they've suggested is it's rather than raising self esteem, it's helping people to relate better to their experiences, like low self esteem or or things connected to that to the low self worth, and helping people. In fact, uh, well, an act approach would would highlight and emphasize a notion of self acceptance. So rather than a journey where we have to transform ourselves and be sort of better people. Uh, it's in fact coming around full circle and acknowledging who we are and appreciating who we are, uh, warts and all, um, not in a you know in a Pollyanna kind of way, uh, but in a way that we we get to see all the aspects of ourselves from our, you know that have been crafted or molded or shaped from our from our journeys. Of course, some traumatic and painful and the, the rocky road roads that we've all been through to to where we arrive with with ourselves uh, and helping people to to have ways to be more appreciable appre to appreciate themselves more to this idea of self-acceptance again oh it's a tricky one because everyone wants to improve themselves and get better and you're saying what do you want me to just put up with these bad qualities of myself well kind of yes and no um yes that that we would suggest then from a platform to say that as a human being, uh, I'm enough. 
Uh, and as a human being, uh, that's enough uh, to hold on to that ticket to allow me, myself, into the human race as a whole. Uh, and then from that platform, we build on uh, all the other things of, of course, self-improvement or changing and growing and developing rather than from a platform to say, I am not enough fundamentally. There's something missing and wrong. And if truth be told, if that got out, I don't really belong in the human race. Uh, and you can see those two very different platforms and how they might go about. And for healthcare workers, it's so, so important. Like it's, it's, it's so easy for our, our sense of who we are to get really bound up with that, uh, a, a worth of being, of giving and caring uh, and being in a, in, a, in a particular way, which is in a lot of respects is, is fan, are fantastic qualities for the job that we need to be able to do because it allows us to be able to connect with people, allows us to be able to empathize, but get ourselves, put ourselves in other people's shoes uh, when we're managing and working with people who are in uh, acute, chronic, physical or emotional uh, pain. We also want some abilities to be agile and flexible for when we need to do that, when perhaps we don't always want to be the giver or the carer. Uh, perhaps we need to be the disciplinarian. Uh, or we need to be sometimes the person who's firm. Uh, sometimes we need to be the person who's perhaps cold or distant when those situations require. So uh, helping helping healthcare workers to, to, to adapt, to be flexible, uh, I love the phrase agile. I like that. Not in a compromising way, like I'm just going to be, you know, a chameleon, but that I can I can adjust myself and my actions to to as the situation allows and affords. As you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, myself and colleagues and people that I work with, um, clients who have found ourselves in situations where um, we have been mistreated by the organization or, or by people within the organization. Um, and part of what's so difficult is I think being really stuck in, in patterns of relating um, that contribute to a stuckness in those dynamics because um, being really kind of fused with with ideas of being nice and helpful and um, responsive and, and always really thinking about the other person's perspective, um, you know, really trying to understand why someone might be doing something or behaving in a certain way, um, you know, being very quick to uh, compromise on our own needs. Um, and those behaviours are often really rewarded as well by our culture and um, society, but can cause a lot of pain and, and distress. Um, and I really like that idea of, as you said, of, of being agile, which isn't about not being the person you are or um, compromising your values, but how that can be really fundamental to being able to live your values. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a really nice book by Susan David uh, called Emotional Agility, which talks a lot about that. Very, it was written for sort of uh, ostensibly for uh, within our um, organizations and people, uh, employees, but, you know, kind of a general book. And that's where that sort of term comes from. And I don't know if it's, I, don't know, I can't remember exactly where it came from, but there, her or some other, well, I don't know, some of these metaphors just sort of float around. It's a really nice one which talks about um, the notion of our, our values being, uh, <clears throat> rather than being, say, a static or concrete thing and these are my values and that's it, uh, uh, that our values perhaps are uh, like being positioned on a globe. Um, and I, I quite like this. Coming from New Zealand and living here in London, um, I, I am from the Antipodes, uh, Antipodean, which means that the polar opposites have I learned not too long ago. Uh, and New Zealand is, is the exact opposite on the globe to where London is. So it's, it's, it's interesting for me. And the, the metaphor here is that if I imagine my values being on a globe and, you know, here's my position in London, I'm embodying and acting upon certain values that are important to me. Uh, and values that perhaps are captured by New Zealand 
are, are, are at the moment in my life are less prominent. Um, and that's not to say, though, when I jump on a plane with my family and we go there, uh, that they've gone. Of course not. They're still there. Uh, just that they might not be front and center at this moment in my life. Uh, and I could say the same thing. Like I, I can imagine those times in my life when I've been confronted by organizations that have have not treated me well, uh, that to successfully navigate those scenarios, it's a bit like I've had to flip my, move my values around. So from being caring and understanding and wanting to understand another person's perspective uh, to move it around to be thinking about myself, uh, thinking about what's good for me, what's good for my family. Uh, those values then become, need to become much more prominent and help me guide to navigate uh, if I'm uh, if I'm encountering a toxic organization who doesn't really need to be understood. <laughs> they just need to, be, I need to set some firm boundaries. But it's a nice reminder to myself, those values are still there though, right? Uh, even though I'm acting upon a different set of values, they still remain there. They're still, of course, important to me and available. I can bring them back around. Not, they haven't disappeared. So there's there's a it's a nice way I think of describing that agility that you're talking about there. And also that that's not necessarily comfortable. Um, that discomfort isn't a sign that you're not acting in line with your values. It might be quite the opposite. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such such a key point. We, uh, I think, Western culture has easily in, inducts us into this idea that discomfort bad comfort good uh and you know you can quite quickly see the the, the logical problems with that and uh where, where we might go if our lives are solely guided by uh if we had you know a metric or a readout of comfort you know, there'd be a whole lot of things we weren't able to do very very soon and Oh gosh, I think about you know my my relationship, um, you know the, the the discomforting times that I've needed to go to to improve that, or difficult conversations, or hard, hard, difficult things I've had to hear, or being a good parent, or I don't know stepping into those spaces of not being a, being a less than good parent, or being at work and uh, you know when things haven't gone well, and stepping into that space of learning from those experiences. And if I was all about comfort, whew, I would be. <laughs> A pretty a pretty shallow human being perhaps <laughs> um it's a nice point yeah so it's that's it, it's just about like sometimes sometimes discomfort is, a, is it means something else it means we're actually heading in the right direction doing the things we care about someone much much wiser than me i can't remember who it is i wish i could remember the attribute the quote in the proper place said uh something like your your in your pain you find your values uh and conversely, in your values, you find your pain. And I feel as uh, there's a few truer words being spoken. And perhaps we could just do a little exercise that sort of speaks to that. And that, uh, you know, as we're talking about work, and we're talking about the the pandemic, and uh, we're talking about a place where there is potential for pain and hurt, and also potential for values to be front and center as well. Okay, so hey, I'm going to do. Uh, like a, a guided exercise, I'm going to ask to go through it with you, and uh, listeners can can do the same. It will be ever so slightly. Um, I was going to use the word meditative. It's, that's probably not quite right, but just by me, me guiding you through this, I'm going to evoke some certain thoughts and feelings and uh, some some responses to those. But in order to do that, should we just spend a moment then stepping out of our automatic pilot and I don't know, for me, that's when I'm busy and mindy and heady up in my head. And if we can in, make an invitation for ourselves to drop back down into our body and just connect for a moment into aspects of our experience, like our feet on the ground, um, wiggle our toes around in our socks, shoes, or fluffy bunny slippers or wherever we find them. And just bring our... Uh, sitting upright and just rolling our shoulders back and allowing them to drop down and bring our attention to our breath and just notice our breathing for what it is and using all of this to remind ourselves that we can connect into our bodies in this moment as a, as a different place to rest rather than located in our minds. 
So as we do this, I'm going to, from this position of being in the moment, anchored and grounded in this place, I'm going to ask if we could uh, take some time to consider, bring together all the things that we've spoken about. We've talked about work and the places at work where we hurt and see if you can allow yourself to let those bubble up a little bit. Those thoughts and feelings that are, and perhaps even memories that are connected to when, when work hurts. It might be easy to connect into a whole range of feelings, or you might find yourself going to a specific instance that represents a time where, where work hurts. Could include stress or anxiety or anger or sadness, grief. And I usually find, in my experience, there's a constellation of things. There's thoughts that bubble up, and there's body sensations, and there's my my memories, and might even be kind of things that connected to what does this mean about me as a person. And as we're doing this, I'm going to see if you can. Observe and notice what might be an automatic pilot reaction to these experiences. The kind of thing that you find yourself just routinely, habitually, automatically doing when these things appear. And without getting into whether they're good or bad or helpful or unhelpful, just allow that to rest and just notice the more the quality I'm looking for is just the automaticness, the habitual things that you find yourself doing when these things show up. And I perhaps be willing to bet that there's a connection there between this stuff and our, our actions and maybe even a bit of a cycle that sometimes happens as these things sort of connect together and uh, play out. If you're a little bit like me, however, you might find that some of these experiences are not always easy to be with, and uh, sometimes that they invite judgment or criticism for just their very presence or uh, are not wanting them to, them to be there. And sometimes it might be the case that I certainly don't find myself particularly listening to these experiences. And having said that, I'm now going to ask you to do that, which is to say... If you were just to sit back and allow these, uh, these painful experiences that are connected to work to have a voice. And it's a voice, just in this instance, that speaks to things you care about. Counterintuitive, perhaps, and maybe that sometimes we don't often hear this perspective. Just say in this moment that they did. What are the things that they would speak to? in terms of the things that really matter to you, the things you care about, where purpose and meaning comes into your life. It might not be big, grand things. It might just be a small, little, quiet thing. And at this point of pain, it says, hey, don't forget that, or hey, remember this. Remembering that notion that where, where you hurt, you care. And where you care, you hurt. And just as we move to the end of this exercise, and perhaps something has bubbled up, and okay if it hasn't, um, if there were something that bubbled up, and maybe a, an image or a picture or a word that's, that's about the thing you care about, or things, my last question just to, to add in there would be, if you were to imagine that that, you were enacting upon that and taking a step in a certain direction, what would be the that step that you would take that would take you closer to that thing being more prominent in your life or more present and available to you? If there's one concrete action that took you in that direction. Small. Just as we end this exercise, I'm going to just invite you to allow whatever mindy stuff was there, images, just thoughts, uh, just to ease and settle into the background as we reconnect back into our body. 
just luxuriate in this moment just to take it some time just to be in our body connecting into our our breath connecting to our shoulders and rolling them back again and sitting up and connecting back into our feet as we end the exercise uh step back into step back into reality <laughs> okay oh thanks for doing that with me um i of course be Thank curious you, to Jay. yeah your experience and any comments and thoughts you had on that mm. it was really interesting actually because i think when you started you know trying to connect with with experiences that related to you know when work hurts I think you, you said that, you know, it might bring up a whole range of, of things and, and it was, you know, lots of things came up for me and it was hard to, you know, settle on something. Um, and, and when you asked about going on autopilot, you know, what is your automatic reaction? I was aware that my automatic reaction was kind of a filter about what will other people think about what's coming up for me, you know, kind of aware of you know maybe having this conversation with you now you know but but that's that is my filter anyway or you know in in real life you know finding it hard to just be with my own experience without a filter of how will this be perceived by other people is this going to cause someone else discomfort um you know always filtering my experience through that lens mm -hmm. um so that was really helpful to become aware of mm. in that moment mm -hmm. and then moving on to to the bit about um what can that pain tell us about what our our values are for me the the um the experience that that sort of stuck around was thinking back to the beginning of of the pandemic and a huge sense of anxiety I felt for the first time feeling like my job could put my family at risk. I think, um, you know, having worked in the NHS in mental health services, which, you know, is a different experience to, you know, being in acute hospital care. But, you know, there are risky times. You know, I've had dangerous times. I've, I've been in, in situations with people who've been very distressed, um, you know, who've had knives and, and threatened to kill themselves in front of me and, you know, scary things have happened. Um, but I had never, ever felt before that my job might put my family at risk. And that was really, really terrifying to, um, to be in that space and to connect with that now. Um, and for me at the start of the pandemic, the other part that was uh, really painful was um the experience of I, I think colleagues you know across the country and and closer to home being put at risk um you know people not having access to the right kinds of protection and being expected to um you know be in situations that that were dangerous for them and dangerous for their families and I found that really really difficult and and for me I guess that's part of my motivation for the work I'm doing now the sense of of holding on to our humanity you know yes we have a job we have um a, a vocational calling but at the end of the day we are people and um you know with vulnerabilities and families and that is just I I can't bear when that gets lost and um, kind of fighting to hold on to that is, yeah, really important to me. And I think since then, you know, now I've, I've, the work I've been doing over the last year, which has been outside of the NHS, but working into um, supporting health professionals in through different avenues has been so fulfilling and so energizing but at times threatens to take me away from my family in other ways, just in terms of um, being really excited and consumed by it. And so that was really helpful just to have that pause and think, you know, what are the concrete things I can do right now just to 
to to be really present with what with what does matter and um that's not to say work isn't important but just like your globe you know there, there's times when that needs to shift um to foreground other things um oh thank you for sharing that yeah there's a lot of heart in what you're saying there paula it's just reflecting there it's, it's you know it's fascinating isn't it just the degree to which we have those times to pause and listen a little bit to those parts that hurt and yeah, how they can speak to things that actually truly matter and um yeah and i don't know i feel i've personally i find it's not 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 an easy thing to do it takes a certain particular context or a scenario for me to slow down and do that and um otherwise it's incredibly easy just to keep rushing on and continuing and being busy and fixing and solving and blah blah um and not having the opportunity to reflect and pause so what joe would you say are, are the things that, that keep you going and what are your kind of go-to things spaces places ideas for when work hurts for you ah, ah so i run um, i'm not a i'm not a particularly <laughs> proficient runner but I, I i run and i absolutely love it um and uh it's yeah it gives me that space of connecting to my to my physicality uh and uh and creating a different place of getting too heady i i i'm very good at doing that i enjoy being up in my head and it's an easy place to go to uh but not always the most productive so having spaces when i don't do that is, is really really important for me um Gosh, I, back in the day, I used to ride to work. Um, <laughs> I used to work uh, around St. Paul's and at, at, uh, around Tottenham Court Road in London um, every day on my bike. And, and then, then coming home would be dodging London buses and uh, decompressing from the day. And yeah, I miss that. Um, I miss some aspects of it, you know, when it's pouring with rain and it's like, you know, pitch black. Sure, okay, I don't miss that. Um, but those things are those things are important um there's a huge bit for me which is about uh, as i said at the start the the good enough um uh and reminding myself good enough is plenty okay it's it's important for me personally because you know, there's a bit of me that uh doesn't isn't happy with good enough and wants to be i don't know you know really really good uh sometimes wants to be perfect um and all the things that i do and uh that's that's not coming from a place that's good for me that's comes from like a old old stuff that says you're not enough or should be more and, and, I, and when i get caught with that i get you know i can get uh pushed hard by that and it really strips out the enjoyment of of life work and the things that I do and um you know I can easily if that catches me I'll just end up walking out of my office you know late and frazzled and just having done too much and I, I really don't enjoy that experience and um and so good enough is 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 it's so important um and it does allow me to to remember the other things that are important to me uh, and do those things um and just you know if you, you know, come across that that um that's got that famous uh, research by Bronnie Ware, do you remember her? It's like she's um ah oh, she's a she's a she's a palli palliative care nurse, uh, Australian, and she uh she did this uh, kind of research. She was you know working with people when they're dying, and she I don't know quite how she did it or, or what she did, but she asked them you know what do you regret most? Oh yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yes. Very punchy question to ask. Right? Yes. On yeah. um, but an important one nonetheless. And, you know, one of the things, t number two was um, uh, I regret working so much. <laughs> uh, and one of the interesting things she said that every man she spoke to, and it's probably a, demo uh, you know, a, a demographic in, uh, in terms of who she was talking to, but uh, uh, they all said that. Um, so that kind of... I think that speaks to all of us, right? Mm, mm, mm. I, I can resonate with that. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be on my deathbed going, you know, yeah. I wish I'd done more reports or just reply just to a few yeah. more emails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's it, it, it's just funny because that that is the space that uh, 
perfect, doing everything to super high standard is rigid and narrow for me. It's not agile. Good enough, there's room. Uh, and there's room for things that are creative. There's room for spontaneity, room for fun. Uh, and that's the thing I, th I think I said at the start. It's a bit that I found out was really important for me. And not, well, yeah, sometimes frivolous fun, but just, I don't know, fun that we're, uh, I can enjoy things and just allow things to roll and un 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 unfold and unpack. And for example, when I was, this is one of the things I love about working from home, I could trundle out and I had my had my lunch and was chatting to my wife and our and our 12, no, 11 month old, soon to be one year, big milestone. Um, and she's, she's just in this kind of, just started to, to you know, words are coming online very soon and uh, giggling a lot. And she was just, uh, my wife was just lying on the ground and she was crawling up and giggling and giggling at, about, and then my wife would be giggling and she'd be giggling and you know, <laughs> she's just you know, getting one of those silly cycles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not kind of particularly high mm -hmm. comedy standards, but you know, she was. Into yeah. <laughs> those kind of moments, you know, just like, all right, those are cool. Um, you know, when I'm caught, I would be rushing back to my office, got to get more emails done. And yeah. So th those are some of the things that are, that are, um, yeah, no, they make a difference. And Joe, if people want to kind of connect with you and, and find out more about your work, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can write me a letter. No, I'm joking. Old school. <laughs> <laughs> they can, um, actually, you know, what? I quite like a letter. I haven't had a letter for a long time apart from, <laughs> from my accountant and from the HMRC. <laughs> um, I am, uh, so at our website is a probably a hub for all sorts of things that we do. Contextualconsulting.co.uk. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter, uh, context consult, Instagram, LinkedIn, <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> but uh yeah any of those those are the places so you know if people want to reach out i mean there's a there's a few places and you can google me and find me and yeah i'd love to hear and you know any reflections on today or people want to hear more about act act in the workplace and act with uh the kind of things we've been talking about for sure reach out get hold of me thanks so much joe ah, thank you thank you for having me thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast Please do share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. I'd love to connect with you, so do come and find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. You can also sign up to my mailing list to keep up to date with future episodes and get useful psychology advice and tips straight to your inbox. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks again, and until next time, take good care.